Tonight's conversation unites two extraordinary women with a unique bond, Mary Seacole and Elizabeth Annie Onwu. Both entered the nursing profession and ended up as pioneers, but one of them successfully campaigned for a statue of the other, resulting in the UK's first statue of a named black woman. Dame Elizabeth is joined in conversation by the broadcasting legend, Shima Pereira, and what promises to be a night of great journeys. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome. This is the second event in the Unfinished Business series of conversations, and I'm in conversation, as you've just heard, with the fabulous name Elizabeth Anionwu. Elizabeth, we're talking mm. about your wonderful life and Mary Seacole's wonderful life, and I have to be completely honest here and say that I had never heard of Mary Seacole until my children were at primary school. And they came back and said they were doing a project on Mary Seacole, and I said, who is she? And they said, well, she was the Black Florence Nightingale mummy. And I said, don't be ridiculous, never heard of her. And I thought, you know, it was the time of bar bar green sheep and all of that kind of uh, misinformation that we were getting about multiculturalism. And I thought, where have they dug this person up from? And then I had a look and found she was real and that she was extraordinary. And I wondered how on earth had I not known about her? So let me move now to you because you're one of those people who put her into the public space once more. So who was Mary Seacole and why is she important? Well, thank you very much and hello everybody. Uh, Sharma, before I even talk about who Mary Seacole was, I have to say that your introduction to Mary Seacole via your school children was identical to that of Boris Johnson, our prime minister. It's the only he... thing I comment. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ju just leave it there, shall we? Uh, so Mary Seacole was born in, we think, 1805. In her autobiography, The Wonderful Adventures of Mrs. Seacole in Many Lands, published in 1857, she's very coy about revealing her exact date of birth. The nearest she comes to it is saying, uh, the century and I were born around the same time. Uh, but on her death certificate, when she died in 1881, her age was 76. So basically people have worked backwards to assume that she was born in 1805. Now she was born in Jamaica. She was of mixed race, Creole, and followed in her mother's footsteps and became a doctress and an entrepreneur. Now a doctress was a Caribbean term some people say, well, you know, it's like a general practitioner, but she also particularly practiced Creole medical herbal medicine as well. So she was an all rounder. She didn't come from wealth. She created wealth. And really what I am struck by in terms of when she was living was how much she traveled. We know of, I think if people know of her, they know that she traveled out to um, care for soldiers and be an entrepreneur during the Crimean War. But she actually traveled to many other countries as well. And she died in London in 1881, in May, 14th of May, 1881. And in her will, she asked that she be buried in St. Mary's Roman Catholic Cemetery in Kensal Green. And at that point, she was actually a celebrated member of British society. There had been two big fundraisers for her because she had run out of money. So she had sort of come full circle. Let me take you right back to when she's born in Jamaica. So she's got this, she's got a Scottish uh, mother and a Creole father. Father. Creole. Scottish father. And a Creole mother. So she learns to be a doctress at sort of at watching her mother or, sort of looking after people and then she decides that she wants to she wants to to save people and to look after people and she really loves that but she's also what really struck me about her given that this is a exhibition about feminism is that she's highly entrepreneurial she's almost swashbuckling bucklingly crazy for adventure and she somehow puts the two together, which is highly unusual at that time. How does that all, how do those pieces come together? Well, I think actually though, although it might've been unusual for other women, for Creole women, 
and particularly there was uh, a real legacy within the Caribbean of doctresses. I mean, it, it, it really went back a couple of centuries who were very, very independent women, feisty women, I, I, I believe, as I think Mary was, who really had this sheer self-belief. And I think they realised, you know, if they were going to make anything of life, they had to do it for themselves. But she sets off, she go, She sets off, first of all, she comes to England twice, once uh, to just sort of visit with a friend, and the second time to try a little bit of business, a bit of buying and selling. She does that on her own. Um, very interestingly, she refers to England as home. She watches the ships going home to England, even though at that point she hasn't even been to England. Um, she then returns to Jamaica and follows her brother, to Panama at a time when there's yellow fever and cholera all over the place. What is the driver then? Well, first of all, uh, I think it's very interesting, Sharma, that you um, recall that she saw England as home. If you think about it in terms of the Windrush experience and before Windrush, England is the mother country, the mother country. So this actually goes back so far. Obviously, England colonised Jamaica. England was seen as the mother country. So to see and read about the link and the emotional link that Mary Seacole had with England is very important. But also, of course, her father was Scottish. And in the opening lines, virtually, of her autobiography, she proudly tells her readers about her Scottish father and how proud she is of Scottish blood coursing through her veins, as she calls it. So she is uh, proud of her Jamaican Creole roots as well. And I, this is what I like about Mary Seacole, but she's incredibly proud of her British connections. No question about it. But this is, she, she is a woman who is so powerful. She, she sets off for Panama. She starts helping her brother who has set up a hotel. And I think trying to read between the lines in those days, you would call it a hotel, but it would almost be like a, a saloon in the white wild west where people are coming in and booking in, but it's not room service. It's literally like a rooming house where people are coming in and they've got cholera and they've got, and, and she's nursing them. But then she gets fed up with her brother and goes off and sets up on her own a hotel which she calls the British Hotel and she starts to nurse alone. I mean I find all of that extraordinary. I think we have to remember once again that her mother was also a doctress and I, I am very curious about her upbringing and she does talk about when she was a child and how she would copy what she saw her mother doing in terms of nursing and caring for the British and American visitors, particularly from the naval um, uh, background. And she talks about, doesn't she, a, a doll and pretending that the doll was a patient. So it's clear that she had a very, very strong respect for her mother. And her mother was a very, very strong ro role model for her. And uh, that, that I, I like that, I have to be honest. So um, yeah, I think it's her mother that has influenced this desire to care for people. But her, her, her thirst for travelling, I don't know where that came from. I, it came from within. She was obviously a very curious person, wasn't she? She loved meeting people. And she was very... <laughs> she, she had such strong image of herself. I mean, you know, she wasn't shy in knowing that she could contribute, that she could make money, that, yeah. Well, that's it, she has this extraordinary drive and she then decides, well, she first of all, she marries Mr. Seacole, mm -hmm. who dies quite quickly, doesn't he? And we know very little about him, even though she, she will be forever known after that as Mary Seacole or Mother Seacole. We don't know anything about him, do we? We know a little bit about him. First, uh, 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 it's thought that, well, it's not thought, it, Mary, I think, mentions that 
he was the godson of Lord Nelson. And Jane Robinson, who, who wrote really the first biography, beautiful biography, I have to say, of Mary Seacole uh, in 2005, which would have been the bicentennial of Mary's um, birth year, uh, did a lot of investigations and tracked down some information about Mr. Seacole. But Mary doesn't say too much about him. You're quite right. Um, in, in, she says a little bit, but not enough to quench our you know, knowledge, uh, quest for knowledge about him. So, uh, yeah, where did she get the drive from? I think, you know, Jamaica, while she was proud of her Jamaican roots, Jamaica was too small for her, I sense. And also, of course, Jamaica was a thriving port, thriving colonial port, plus there were, you know, for the British, but in terms of the Americans were there as well. I think it's clear that Mary met an awful lot of people, first of all, by helping her mother out in her hotel uh, and then taking over Blundell Hall, British Hotel, from her mother. So I think maybe meeting up with all these varied guests made Mary want to go to those lands herself. Plus, again, remembering this strong link she had with... Britain, but also her entrepreneurial skills. And yeah, Jamaica, I think, was a bit too small for her. Although she kept going back and forth to Jamaica, but she asked to be buried in London, which is interesting. Yeah, because that was always, it seems to me, where she was intended to be. Because she then, of course, the, the Crimean War starts and she reads about it, Florence Nightingale, has been asked to set up uh, a nursing a group of nurses to go over and deal with the Crimean War, or to help with the Crimean War. And Mary Seacole decides that she also wants to be a part of that. And she actually applies to Florence Nightingale and meets her in Constantinople, I think it is, to uh, ask if she can join those nurses. And, and is, is sort of, is dismissed. It's a bit more complex than that. <laughs> first, first of all, Mary, first and foremost, as well, was an entrepreneur. And also, she loved British, the British soldiers and, 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 and the sailors that she knew from Blundell Hall in Jamaica. And it was there that she heard about the Crimean War, because these beloved sons, as she called them, were going off to the Crimea. But she'd already, before she heard about the Crimean War, she'd already planned to make yet another visit, as you alluded to, to uh, London, to England, on business, because she knew she could make money selling her Jamaican spices and wares. And she was obviously, uh, I think, quite a good businesswoman. So she decided she would combine the two so that uh, she would find out more when she got to London about the Crimean War. And she did apply to, uh, what, what happened was she went to the house of Mrs. Herbert, who was a, uh, the friend of Florence Nightingale. When Mary got to London, Florence Nightingale had already left for Scutari. So they, they didn't meet in London, but she went to uh, the house where there had been the recruitment of nurses for to, to go with Florence Nightingale. And she was told, well, you know, they've already recruited this, the second group of nurses. Um, and was, was told, well, you know, it's, it's too late. We've already recruited them. So you, you could see it as a rebuff. And in fact, Mary wondered whether she was being rebuffed because of the color of her skin. So we don't quite know whether that was the case or whether she just missed the boat literally in terms of the recruitment process but she said Mary was very determined and she decided that come what may she knew she was so strong in what she could offer to her soldiers out there in the Crimea she would make her own way out there and as you say she did she paid her for her own travel expenses and got herself out there uh, I, I just would have loved to have met Mary Seacole, I really would. 
Believe me, so would I. <laughs> I'm extremely glad that I've met you because, of course, I also want to talk to you about you. And there are certain parallels, if you like. There are There's a racial par parallel. There's a parallel in your interests and what you did for your career and uh, a parallel in your positioning of public health is where you want to make a difference. So before we go any further with Mary Seacole, I want to find out a little bit more about Elizabeth Annie Onwu. And I just want to remind the audience that if you have any questions, there's a question box at the bottom of the screen that you can fill in and they will be pinged to me and I can include them um, in our conversation. So Elizabeth, tell me, we know that your mother was Irish. Your father Irish was heritage. Yes. You take it from there. So I actually called my memoirs Mixed Blessings from a Cambridge Union because Sharma, I was the outcome of an affair of my parents as students at Cambridge University just after the Second World War. And my mother became pregnant with me towards the end of her second year studying classics. Now, this she never married my father, so one can imagine the scandal and shame that she would have experienced because she came from a very loving but strict and devout Roman Catholic Irish heritage family. So I think she was second generation. So um, she decided to leave Cambridge. And I must admit, as, as a woman, you know, I, I, that is a big regret. I wished, you know, today she could have combined her studies and, and had, had a child as well, but no, she gave up her studies. And my father went back to Nigeria as a qualified lawyer and became a civil servant and ambassador and all sorts of things. Um, and they were never to meet up again. So that was the situation. And because it was difficult for my mother to initially make a home for me as a single parent, I lived in a children's home for the first nine years, but my mother never, it was, I had no sense of rejection in terms of my mother, which has helped me enormously through my life. Uh, she always made it clear she wanted to make a home for me and one day I would leave the convent which I did aged nine. I, I went to live with my with her and my stepfather and sadly that didn't work out lasted for 20 months because we're talking about the mid-1950s now Sharma in the Midlands in this country and I was the only black child in that neighborhood and my stepfather apparently started to get teased by his mates in the pub what's he doing having a half caste child in his house because of course that was the term that was used and uh, he took it out on me by physically uh, abusing me. So I went to, I was rescued by my maternal grandparents and spent a, a pleasant adolescence there. And I came down to London at 18 and did my nursing. That's potted history of me. I don't know whether there's anything more that you... I, I, I think that you got a love for nursing. You didn't have a doctress as a mother, but you did have a nun at the home. That's right. Yes, yes. Um, in my childish mind, I called her the white nun. Well, all the nuns in the convent were white. They were all Irish as well. Uh, but she wore a white habit rather than the traditional black habit. So she was the white nun. And I loved her to bit Sharma because I had very bad eczema that needed dressing, daily dressings. And uh, it was a lovely cool paste that they put on bandage was put over it but when it came to changing the dressing the bandage was now stuck to this paste stuck to my skin and she was the only nun that would remove my dressing without causing me any pain she used distraction therapy what was that well you know this is a strict catholic upbringing i am in the middle of a convent with all nuns looking after me and nuns we were told they were the brides of christ very religious women and yet you know this it's still making me laugh now she would, as she was changing the dressing, she would use words that to me were so rude. Oh, what were these words? Bottom, I mean, come on, bottom. But you know, yeah, in a child's mind, you don't, a nun doesn't use that word. And I would fall for it every time, start laughing. Before I knew it, bandage was off. It, it, it was wonderful. So you come to London, I think you come to Paddington General Hospital, don't you? That's right. Actually, that's where I was growing up. Oh. And you are just having a fairly normal standard nursing career for the time when you reconnect with your father. Mm. What happened then? 
Well, I was now 25 and I was a qualified health visitor working in Brent. And I had written to my mother in the March of that year. I'd always wanted to know about him, but you know, as a child and young adult, nobody talked about my father and I was sensible enough to know, they're not mentioning him, don't ask any questions. But I then wrote to my mother and said, look, just tell me about my father, what's his name? And she wrote back immediately saying, look, I've been meaning to tell you, but it hasn't been convenient. I, my half brothers and sisters were always in the house when I visited. So she gave me his name and she said, but Lawrence Odiato Victor Anionwu. She said, he's a lawyer. He's gone back to Nigeria. We didn't have the internet then, Sharma, in those days. And she said, I don't think you'll be able to find him. And I'm not actually sure it's a good idea for you to try and look for him. And the reason she, she was worried that I might be rejected by his family. Now I had that uh, name in the back of my diary for three months because I didn't know any Nigerians. I knew uh, people from the Caribbean, um, but anyway, I then realized I knew an African lawyer, the late um, uh, John Roberts QC and he, he, in conversation, he happened to mention that he occasionally taught Nigerian law students. I, ooh, I showed John my father's name and I said, do you think you could find out what part of Nigeria this name is from? Because it was only a couple of years, Sharma, after a terrible Nigerian civil war, the Biafran war. So I, I, I knew there were different ethnic groups in Nigeria, but that was about it. So he said, okay, leave it with me. Now this is a Monday evening. Uh, I'll see what I can find out. Wednesday morning, he rang me at my clinic. I've spoken to your father. Oh, you couldn't make this up, Sharma. I mean, I was just rooted to the spot. What? In Nigeria? He said, no, in Palmer's Green, North London. <laughs> it's a wonderful story, isn't it? It's um, unbelievable. It's and I met, I met my father the next day. It was as fast as that. And you know, I, I was to know him for eight years before he died. He died quite young, unfortunately. But you know, I love my mother, I love my Irish heritage family. They were they have they were and are still very supportive of me. And thankfully, I was also to get on so well with my father. How lucky was I? Because you can imagine I follow similar stories of people who are trying to find their biological parents. And sadly, it doesn't always work out well. But it did for me. And it sorted me out. It made me confident and uh, it was wonderful. Well, I, I think he, and I'm reading between the lines here, but I think what he appeared to do was he made you aware of your own power and that your career didn't have to be a sort of gradual trajectory. You could actually use what you knew to create change. And that coincided and I'm sorry to keep telling you your own story but I, we've, there, it, there's so much of it that that coincided I think with you coming across a problem amongst black families in Brent that you had never been uh, aware of at medical school and that was sickle cell. That's right so in my own nurse um, three-year nurse education program in Paddington late 1960s so we we have to remember the context of the late 1960s, West London, there was a significant black population during that period, and yet never taught about sickle cell. Neither was I taught about Mary Sickle, but I'm sure we'll come on to that. But, you know, I wasn't taught about sickle cell. So here I am, a health visitor, recently qualified, visiting families in West London, and there is a mother that I meet who has a son with sickle cell anemia, who's, who, this, the, this little boy is lying on the couch, moaning a little bit in pain. He's, I think he's had a hospital admission. He's just been discharged. And the mother was reasonably happy with the medical care her son had, but she was frustrated that she couldn't find answers to all the questions a mother has when they have a child with a long-term illness such as this. And I, I couldn't help her. And I think she had me on a little bit of a pedestal. I, I did get on very well with a lot of my families but I couldn't give her any e extra information about this illness. And I was frustrated. I was um, ashamed a bit, you know, but I was also very angry. And I had this, 
uh, why, you know, I was talking to myself, not, I didn't say this to the mother, of course. Why wasn't I taught about this condition? Not only in my nurse education programme, but my health visiting education programme, which was in the early 1980s in West London. Neither even mentioned the, the illness. And when I look back in my textbook for nurses, medicine for nurses, it was called, wasn't even in the index. I hadn't, I hadn't slept through the lecture. I hadn't missed the lecture. I hadn't missed out this. We weren't taught about it, Sean. So at this point, you then decide to find out everything you can about sickle cell. That includes going to the US where they run uh, sickle cell clinics. You, in your own way, are emulating uh, what Mary Seacole has done, completely different locations. It's a, it's a different landscape but it's the same sort of journey. You go to the US, you learn about what there is to be done and you come back and you create our first nurse-led clinic for sickle cell and thalassemia, is that right? Yes, I, I was working with a Dr. Misha Brozovic who was the consultant haematologist. And when I, um, we had an informal interest in sickle cell. And when I came back from the States, I was telling her, nurses play a very significant part in what we call the multidisciplinary team. I didn't realise nurses could do that. Hey, this is what I'd like to be. And she fully supported that. She actually found the funding in the initial two years for my, my, my salary uh, and found a couple of rooms at Wilsdon Hospital. And that's when I set up this myself as, as a sickle cell nurse specialist, yes, and included thalassemia as well, because that was an equally important inherited condition where families required the similar information and support. As part of that development and growth, you become an emeritus professor at the University of West London, where you again set up a, you know, specialisms in sickle cell and thalassemia. And it's at this point that the two stories start to join because you also set up a section that is named after Mary Seacole. And so I want you to tell me at which point in your timeline you learned the full story of Mary Seacole and how that affected the way you thought, not just about Mary Seacole, but actually about yourself. Um, well, first of all, just to, in terms of your uh, uh, kind introduction just there, um, when I, I was made a professor of nursing at the University of West London, and when I retired in 2007, they very kindly gave me the honorary title of Emeritus Professor of Nursing, which has enabled me to keep a link with the university and the students, which is, which is wonderful. Now, when I arrived in, in, at the, the University of West London, uh, about 1998, I think it was, I was really very surprised that there's many of the tutors nurse tutors and the students in particular were in the situation I was in in 1984 that I had never heard of Mary Seacole I first heard about Mary Seacole in 1984 way after I'd done my uh, educational nursing programs and that was because two women Audrey Juji and Ziggy Alexander bought out for the first time Mary Seacole's 1857 autobiography. They edited it, they, they bought it out. And I remember going to the launch, buying a copy of this book. I couldn't put this book down. I mean, I do love reading, but this was incredible. I mean, what, what a journey. What a, I mean, what a woman. I mean, she's, the way she wrote that autobiography is absolutely incredible. But I'm thinking, so I'm enjoying the book, I'm learning. But again, my anger, my anger has driven me to all sorts of things, Sharma, positive things, I have to say. I was angry. How come I had never learned about Mary Seacole when I was a student nurse, when I was a health visitor? Now, look, I admire Florence Nightingale for her contributions to the nursing profession. There's no question about that. But hey, hold on. Mary Seacole was out there in the Crimea at the same time, different roles. And Florence Nightingale and Mary Seacole were equally well known to the British Victorian public due to the reporting of the Times correspondent, Sir William Howard Russell, the war correspondent of the Times newspaper. Can you imagine? He admired both Florence Nightingale and Mary Seacole. And yet now, hey, hold on. How come Mary Seacole's dropped off this 
and yet in her day, she was recognised. She was fated by the uh, British public. Queen Victoria donated to uh, as the Seacole Fund. My goodness, what a woman. How come I'd never been taught about her as a student? That really angered me because the race issue starts to come in, Sharma. Be very upfront with you. What's the difference between these two women? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yes, absolutely. And of course, um, just to remind our audience that if you want to ask any questions, there's a question box at the bottom of the screen that you can fill in and I will get to see your questions as they come in. Elizabeth, race is very important because when I was reading Mary Seacole's book, I actually noted that she hesitates to refer to herself as black. She refers to herself as Creole, which is a mix. She refers to the Scottishness. She refers to the to an Englishness about herself. She refers to her being a different, darker shade. She describes herself as just a few shades darker than brunettes uh, when she's in London. It's very interesting. She seems, it seemed to me, to struggle with defining what she was racially. She, she, she was not white, but she doesn't either describe herself as black, does she? Um. I have to disagree with you there I, to some extent. You're quite right in terms of the very colored that she, she does use black. And I'm going, I, if you allow me, can I just quote from her autobiography just to demonstrate it, it's new up until this point, it is more nuanced. So I understand that, Sham. But look, so she's been um, done. So, this is now in Panama, South America, where there's been a cholera outbreak and she has looked after all these American uh, sort of traders and they hold a dinner in her honor. And this guy stands up and gives uh, a speech in, 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 in honor of anti sequel So, well, gentle, I'm not doing the American accent. So, well, gentlemen, I expect you'll all support me in drinking of this toast that I, to anti sequel So gentlemen, I give you anti sequel we can't do less for her after what she's done for us. When the cholera was amongst us, not many months ago, so I say, God bless the best yalla woman in here. he ever made from Jamaica, gentlemen from the Isle of Springs. Well, gentlemen, I expect there are only two things we're vexed for. And the first is that she ain't one of us, a citizen of the great United States. And the other thing is, gentlemen, that Providence made her a yellow woman. I calculate, gentlemen, you're as, all as vexed as I that she's not wholly white. But I do reckon on you rejoicing with me that she's so many shades removed from being entirely black. And I guess if we could bleach her by any means, we would. And thus make her acceptable to any company as, the, as she deserves to be. Gentlemen, I give you anti Seacol. This is this is. Mrs. Seacol now replying, writing first of all. And so the orator sat down amidst much applause. Maybe suppose that I did not need much persuasion to return thanks, burning as I was to tell them my mind on the subject of my color. Indeed, if my brother had not checked me, I should have given them my thoughts somewhat too freely. As it was, I said, so gentlemen, I return you my best thanks for your kindness in drinking my health. As for what I've done in Crucius Providence, evidently made me to be useful and I can't help it. But I must say that I don't altogether appreciate your friend's kind wishes with respect to my complexion. If it had been as dark as any, and she uses the N word, but in, I, I would say in a descriptive, but certainly not a negative way, I should have been just as happy and as useful and as much respected by those whose respect I value. And as to his offer of bleaching me, I should, even if it were practicable, decline it with any thanks. As to the society which the process might gain me admission into, all I can say is that judging from the specimens I've met with here and elsewhere, I don't think that I shall lose much by being excluded from it. So, gentlemen, I drink to you and the general reformation of American manners. Boink. <laughs> which is wonderful and it must be said that she clearly struggled with structural racism which I think is still evident in in certainly in healthcare but she's she's dealing with it at 
every level. And she overcame it because she has this extraordinary, robust self-belief, which enables her to just ride over any kind of negative encounter and to have an absolute sense of purpose and what she wants to do. And while you are reading, Elizabeth, I think there's what's really interesting about Mary Seacole, reading her, her autobiography, is her real need, and I think she uses the term at one point, to be a heroine. Mm -hmm. She has a real sense of self, and she writes this book, which, you know, is, is it's robustly self um, aggrandizing is not the word I want, but it's it she's self self promoting. Self promoting. She's 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 got a fantastic sense of self. And she is also very aware, I mean she's very much a modern woman. I mean, you know, she's a feminist, she's she's got she's self-directed, she's self-supporting, uh, she does what she wishes to do in the way that she wants to do it, but she also is playing with the news agenda in the sense that she's deciding how she wants to be portrayed. And I think you've also got another reading for us, which really speaks to the way that she is positioning herself throughout her book. Yes. It, which is which in, 13, isn't it? Which is the, yes. when she goes to the Crimea. That's right. Crimea. Would you like me to um, read that now? That'd be great. Yes, please. Okay, uh, and I, to I totally agree with with, with your analysis, uh, Sharma. So she, this is chapter thirteen, entitled "My Work in the Crimea." It's a longer section than I've just read. I, 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 a warning. I hope the reader will give me credit for the assertion that I am about to make, viz. that I enter upon the particulars of this chapter with great reluctance, but I cannot omit them for the simple reason that they strengthen my one and only claim to interest the public vis-a-vis -vis my services to the brave British army in the Crimea. But fortunately, I can follow a course which will not only render it unnecessary for me to sound my own trumpet, but will be more satisfactory to the reader. I can put on record the written opinion of those who had ample means of judging and ascertaining how I fulfilled the great object which I had in view in leaving England for the Crimea. And before I do so, I must solicit my reader's attention to the position I held in the camp to, to, as doctress, nurse, and mother. I have never been long in any place before I have found my practical experience in the science of medicine useful. Even in London, I have found it of service to others. And in the Crimea, where the doctors were so overworked, and sickness was so prevalent, I could not be long idle. For I never forgot that my intention in seeking the army was to help the kind-hearted doctors to be useful to, who I, to whom I've ever looked upon and still regard as so high a privilege. But before very long, I found myself surrounded with patients of my own, and this for two simple reasons. In the first place, the men, I'm speaking of the ranks now, had a very serious objection to going into hospitals for any but urgent regions. And the regimental doctors were rather fond of sending them there. And in the second place, they could and did get at my store, sick comforts and nourishing food, which the heads of the medical staff would sometimes find it difficult to pr procure. These reasons with the additional one that I was very familiar with the diseases which they suffered most from and successful in their treatment, I say this in no spirit of vanity, were quite sufficient to account for the numbers who came daily to the British Hotel for medical treatment. That the officers were glad of me as a doctress and nurse may be easily understood. When a poor fellow lay sickening in his cheerless hut and sent down to me, he knew very well that I should not ride up in answer to the message empty handed. And although I did not hesitate to charge him with the value of the necessities, necessaries I took him, still he was thankful enough to be able to purchase them. When we, when we lie ill at home, surrounded with comfort, we never think of feeling any special gratitude for the sick room delicacies which we accept as a consequence of our illness. 
But the poor officer, lying ill and weary in his crazy heart, dependent for the merest necessities of existence upon a clumsy, ignorant soldier cook, who would almost prefer eating his meat raw to having the trouble of cooking it, our English soldiers are bad campaigners, often finds his greatest troubles in the wants of those little delicacies with which a, st a weak stomach must be humoured into retaining nourishment. How often have I felt sad at the sight of poor lads who in England thought attending earlier parade a hardship and felt harassed if their neckcloth set awry or the natty little boots would not retain their polish, bearing and bearing so nobly and bravely trials and hardships to which the veteran campaigner frequently succumbed. Don't you think, reader, if you were lying with parched lips and fading appetite, thousands of miles from mother, wife or sister, loathing the rough food by your side and thinking regretfully of that English home where nothing that could minister to your great need would be left untried. Don't you think that you would welcome the familiar figure of the stout lady whose bony horse has just pulled up at the door of your hut and whose panniers contain, contain some cooling drink, a little broth, some homely cake, or a dish of jelly or blanche, a blancmange? Don't you think, under such circumstances, that you would heartily agree with my friend Punch's work, remarks. That berry brown face with a kind heart's trace impressed on each wrinkled sly was a sight to behold through the snow clouds rolled across the iron sky. I tell you, reader, I have seen many a bold fellow's eyes moisten at such a season when a woman's voice and a woman's care have brought to mind their minds recollection of those happy English homes which some of them never saw again. But many did who will remember their woman comrade upon the bleak and barren heights before Sebastopol. Then their calling me mother was not, I think, altogether unmeaning. I used to fancy that there was something homely in the word. And reader, you cannot think how dear to them was the smallest thing that reminded them of home. Some of my Crimean patients, who were glad of me as nurse and doctress, bore names familiar to all England. And perhaps, did I ask them, they would allow me to publish their names. I am proud to think that a gallant sailor on whose brave breast the order of Victoria rests, a more gallant man can never wear it sent for the doctress whom he had known in Kingston, when his arm, wounded on the fatal 18th of June, the footnote reminds us that this was the battle, the assault on the Redan, so sent for the, sorry, when his arm, wounded on the fatal 18th of June, refused to heal, and I think that the application I recommended did it good. <laughs> I just, I just love her. She's just, she's entrepreneurial. She is uh, incredibly good hearted, but she always has an eye on making sure Mary Seacole is A, doing what she wants to do and B, is not suffering for having done it. And I absolutely, to me, she is the ultimate feminist. Now, that's not why you then, Elizabeth, having established yourself in a thousand ways, decided to become the champion, really, for the statue of Mary Seacole, which now stands outside St Thomas's Hospital. When you started to argue for that, what, did, what were your reasons for wanting her commemorated in that way? Well, first of all, it was Lord Clive Soley whose idea it was to have the memorial statue, and he invited me and 10 other trustees to join forces with him. I, as you've already um, uh, discussed, I, I was already aware, obviously, of Mary Seacole, and she was one of my role models. And, and, and the reason why I, I, I could relate to her for several um, uh, similar backgrounds, if you like, I was I am mixed race, as was Mary Seacole. Uh, her parents were Creole, Jam Jamaican and Scottish. Uh, my parents were Irish heritage and Nigerian. She was also a nurse and a doctress. 
and I have always from a small child wanted to be a nurse and take away pain I think that was my first reason and Mary Seacole obviously wanted to provide comfort care nourishment but also um, nurse in the term of professionally nursing um, uh, soldiers uh, and um, you know there are some people say oh well she wasn't a real nurse well I have to remind those people they don't actually know the history of the nursing profession because uh, Florence Nightingale did her training which was for a few months in a hospital in Germany observing uh, and it wasn't until after the Crimean War I think you've mentioned that she set up she was invited to set up the first school of nursing in 1860 at St Thomas's Hospital. So Mary was brought up in Jamaica. She observed and followed in her mother's tradition, Jamaican doctress, which was as near as you could get to being a nurse as possible. So I think, you know, I am attracted to Mary Seacole because uh, she, she was a very inquisitive person. I know that I constantly ask questions. She saw gaps, she filled those gaps. She was also very, very feisty, and she she didn't tolerate fools gladly. And when I was doing interviews for my memoirs, guess what? Some people said about me. So I thought, well, I'm in good company, you know. Uh, so I could see the similarities of Mary Seacole and myself, and that's what once I'd read her memoirs, that's what drew me to her, and I wanted to name my my research centre after her when I was. Professor of Nursing at the University of West London. And to, to then get the statue up, we've had a question to ask, which says, how hard was it? And let me remind the audience that you've got the question box under the screen, so get them in quickly, because we've only got about another 10 minutes or so. Um, how hard was it to get the statue of Mary Seacole accepted and up? That is a brilliant question. It was so tough. Uh, it's the only time I had a sleepless night where I cried throughout the night because we didn't make it public, why should we? But there was a, a vociferous minority and a really small group of people who were utterly opposed to Mary Seacole's statue. First of all, being cited in St. Thomas's Hospital. You know, um, she didn't have any links there. No, she didn't. But you know, St. Thomas's, uh, recognized that the chairman of um, St. Thomas's Hospital, recognized that his hospital served a diverse community by a diverse staff. And it was only right that they should cite Mary Seacole there. And I, I was so proud of St. Thomas's uh, NHS Trust, I can tell you. And um, yeah, so I, agreed with, you know, when um, uh, Lord Soley approached me and, and as say others, yeah, I was up for it because as, as I've already said, Mary Seacole was a role model to me and she was mixed race. And I thought, yeah, yeah I, 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 I'm up for this. The, the, the minority, but vociferous opposition was more than balanced by a huge, Shama, a huge outpouring of support nationally from all walks, well, from I've, all backgrounds. Elizabeth, I would, you know, I was completely behind it, having finally learned who Mary Seacole was. But interestingly, our questioner then goes on to say, and why does the statue matter? And I want to now put it into a mm -hmm. 2000, 2020 question which is that it was so important because so much of the statuary that we see tells a colonialist, has a colonial, colonialist narrative. Um, and it's about power and it's about subjugation in many ways. And so it was so vital to have Mary Seacole there for women, for people of color, uh, for all medical, all those people in the medical profession, which still stuff, suffers from uh, structural racism and structural gendered uh, problems as well, I'm sure. But the view about statues has changed in recent times. Do you think that changes the way you feel about the statue of Mary being there? 
No, it doesn't. But I do accept, and even before Colston being thrown overboard, um, I, I, I was always conscious that a negative aspect of statutory and monuments is the idolatry aspect, you know, literally putting somebody on a pedestal. So I am conscious of that. But that is a, 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 that's a small concern I have about this. Um, I am totally at ease now with having been involved with others in the campaign to, to have the statue of Mary Seacott. And I, I am delighted, you know, that the country rallied round. Uh, as you say, you know, we got support from women, we got support from minority ethnic um, individuals and organisations. We got support from a, such a range of people. We had to raise three quarters of a million pounds in, th in 12 years. That, that uh, it was a period of austerity during that period. It was tough, but we did it through people being able to resonate with what Mary Seacole stood for. And we wanted more statues of women. That was a very important push because it's horrendous if you look at the small number of women. So yes, there is a question of, you know, are statues necessary? I think they are. I think they're part of our cultural uh, heritage. And it, it was about time a, a, a brown skinned woman got up onto one of those pedestals. Here, here. Um, <laughs> this exhibition is called Unfinished Business. Do you think from Mary Seacole's point of view, she would consider that the statue finishes her business? Oh, I think so. She was a very proud woman. And I think, she, well, I know she would be delighted. I think she would be surprised. I mean, she was a very proud woman. She was a very confident woman. She loved the Britishness, you know. So to be overlooking the River Thames, the Houses of Parliament. And you know what? Mary Seacole got on with people and hobnobbed with people from all walks of life the ordinary soldier, who she really loved as, as sons. To, but she loved those generals as well. And my goodness, could she mix and go up and down the hierarchy of the military uh, organization. She would be absolutely delighted that she's on this statue, on this pedestal. I, as I said, I don't think she would have believed she would have been on one in the way that she is. And what about you? So you've got, uh, a fellowship of the Royal College of Nursing, you got a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Pride of Britain, you've got an honorary doctorate, you're an emeritus professor. Um, have you got unfinished business? You've had the statue of Mary Seacole put up? I, 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 my unfinished business is, is actually with the younger generation. I'm a mother and I'm a, a grandmother. So um, I'm, I'm I'm concerned with their, not just with my mother, sorry, not just with my daughter and my granddaughter, but they represent to me, I'm looking at the, 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 the experiences they're having, obviously at this particular moment, the impact of COVID-19, the, the, the issues facing women. I, 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 we, you see, the women feature strongly in my narrative. There's my mother, there's myself, there's my daughter, there's my granddaughter. And we are, we are all very conscious of the role of women and how we just must not have any anxieties because we are women. In fact, our strength is drawn from women and the history of what women have and are and will continue to contribute to society. Within nursing, what, what do you think needs to change? And I must tell you that somebody has sent a note saying this is the most riveting conversation. They're just absolutely loving what you're saying and they want you to, have, to make a movie of your life. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. You yeah. have to have your daughter to play you, I suppose. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> I like that idea, yeah. Yes, but, but you know, what do you feel with nursing we're talking about. needs to be done? And what, what, what are you sort of still feeding into, albeit perhaps quietly? Well, one area, as you can as you can appreciate, that I am very supportive of, and, and supportive in a quiet way, as you said, mentoring uh, and uh, it, it, and on social media, that's where I'm more active. It, it is the better representation of Black and minority ethnic individuals in the in the in the upper echelons of the National Health Service, and there is a heck of a lot more work. I've seen more work done on this in the last five years than I've seen in all of my career. So I am actually um, 
an, an optimist that, uh, as somebody said, you know, um, the glass ceiling, getting through the glass ceiling, it's actually a brick wall for uh, black and minority, some black and minority health professionals. It's, it's, there's a lot to do because there's a lot of black and minority health professionals in the NHS. And there's a lot in the lower tiers of the NHS and we need more of them represented throughout uh, the, 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 the national and contribute all their expertise. And you know, COVID, we're in the second wave and we're already seeing black and minority ethnic health professionals dying yet again. It's, 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 it's devastating. And, you know, uh, at least reward them with a quality of life in the NHS that they deserve. And does being a dame grant you any special, <laughs> uh, I suppose, access or, you know, acceleration in your preoccupations? Or no, it, 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 I think it surprises certain quarters it's, <laughs> when they see it. That, that's, that's about it. That it yeah, no, I, I it, no, I know is the answer. <laughs> so so you, you're called Dame and it just does, it hasn't done anything for you, really. I, I tell you who, where I've, I, 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 I am actually quite embarrassed about a term like that, but I did accept the honour. But I tell you where I'm glad I did, because friends and colleagues said to me, Elizabeth, you have to think about others in our profession, the younger generation, or those who recently come in. And when I, before COVID, and even online, uh, the response I get from that younger generation, both black and white, actually, but obviously I have a particular interest because of my own experiences with black and minority ethnic health. And the joy on their faces when they see this, you know, professor, emeritus professor of nursing who looks like them, you know, who's not had all the experiences that they probably had. I mean, my life hasn't been that awful, you know, but I can see that it, your life has been quite difficult, Elizabeth, and I do want... Yeah, my early life, yes. Yeah, yes. There's a final thought, really, that what also unites you and Mary, though we don't mm. know how easy or difficult her early life may have been, is a, a, a kind of ability to, to put everything behind you mm. and only look forwards, which I think does seem to be a uniting characteristic. Yes, I mean, I'm often asked, how on earth can I be so, I think resilient is a, co a popular word at the moment, how, 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 how come I'm so upbeat? How did I, how did I manage to achieve what I've achieved, uh, you know, despite occasional brutal aspects in my childhood? Um, I, 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 and and I, I, it wasn't a stable childhood, obviously. And there's something from within, and I, I, I talk about deep-seated anger, but this deep-seated anger at injustice, at racism, at what my mother had to go through, some issues I've had to experience, uh, and issues in the world today. I I've channeled that anger positively into energy used in a positive way to campaign with others, and particularly in respect to sickle cell disease and the, the joining uh, Lord Soli's campaign for the statue of Mary Seacole, I, I, because I, I, that anger would have been turned inwardly in a negative way, and I would be one of those people who would have maybe had mental health problems. I have had high blood pressure, but it's managed, so that's where it's affected me, the stress, I think, and asthma and things like that, but I've fortunately recognised the strengths that I have. It took me some time, you know, that I am intelligent, that, that I've got an ability to make friends and, and, and those friends and relatives support me um, and that I'm clear in what I want to do and people have seen something in me and helped me along the way. And I've, I've actually thoroughly enjoyed it. And actually I've quite enjoyed the battles as well. Might surprise people. <laughs> Thank you very much. I think what you've done tonight actually has made us realise that we can all probably battle a bit harder uh, and put our money where our mouth is, if you like. So that is it from us for this evening. Thank you, Dame Elizabeth Annie Onwu. Uh, the Unfinished Business events continue, of course, and the exhibition is on until Sunday, 21st of February. From us, good night. Can I, can I thank you, Sharma, very much, and B as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.